Hi, it's Maria from Still Dreaming Homestead, and it's time for our story. We're reading in the book, Farmer Boy, by Laura Ingalls Wilder. So, today's chapter, which is, I think, chapter five, yes, chapter five, is called Birthday. Next morning, while Amonzo was eating his oatmeal, Father said this was his birthday. Amonzo had forgotten it. He was nine years old that cold winter morning. There's something for you in the woodshed, Father said. Amonzo wanted to see it right away, but Mother said that if he did not eat his breakfast, then he was sick and must take medicine. Then he ate fast as he could, and she said, don't take such big mouthfuls. Mothers always fuss about the way you eat. You can hardly eat anything in the way that pleases them. But at last breakfast was over and Amonzo got to the woodshed. There was a little calf yoke. Father had made it a bread cedar, so it was strong and yet light. It was Amonzo's very own and father said so. Yes, son, you are old enough to break the calves. That means to train them. Amonzo did not go to school that day. He did not have to go to school when there was more important things to do. He carried the little yoke to the barn and father went with him. Amonzo thought that if he handled the calves perfectly, Perhaps father might let him help with the colts next year. Colts meaning baby calves. Star and Bright were in their warm stall in the south barn. Their little red sides were sleek and silky from the currying, that means brushing, Amonzo had given them. They crowded against him when they went into their stalls and licked at him with their wet, rough tongues. They thought he had brought them carrots. They did not know he was going to teach them how to behave like big oxen. Father showed him how to fit the yoke carefully to their soft necks. It's hot in here. He must scrape it inside. its inside curves with a bit of broken glass till the yoke fit perfectly and the wood was silky smooth. Then Amonzo let down the bars of the stall and the wander wandering calves followed him into the dazzling, cold, snowy barnyard. Father held up one end of the yoke while Amonzo laid the other end on Bright's neck. Then Amonzo lifted up the bow under Bright's throat and pushed its ends through the holes made for the yoke. He slipped its wooden bow pin through one end of the bow above the yoke and held the bow in place. Bright kept twisting his head and trying to see the strange thing on his neck, but Amonzo had made him so gentle that he stood quietly and Amonzo gave him a piece of carrot. Star heard him crunching it and came to get his share. Father pushed him around besides Bright under the other end of the yoke and Amonzo pushed the other bow up under his throat and fastened it with a bow pin. There, already he had his little yoke of oxen. Now I'm going to show you what it looks like. This was something so that the two uh, oxen, or it could be on other animals too, would work together. And here's what it looks like. Okay. Then father tied a rope around Star's nub horns and the Monzo took the rope. He stood in front of the calves and shouted, Giddy up! Star's neck stretched out longer and longer. Amonzo pulled till finally Star stepped forward. 
upright, snorted and pulled back. The yoke twisted Star's head around and stopped him. And the two calves stood wondering what it was all about. Father helped Amonzo push them till they stood properly side by side again. Then he said, well, son, I'll leave you to figure it out. And he went into the barn. Then Amonzo knew that he was really old enough to do important things by himself. He stood in the snow and looked at the calves and they stared innocently at him. He wondered how to teach them what giddy up meant. There wasn't any way to tell them, but he must find some way to tell them. When I say giddy up, you must walk straight ahead. Amonzo thought a while. Then he left the calves and went to the cow's feed box and filled his pockets with carrots. He came back and stood up, stood as far in front of the calves as he could, holding the rope in his left hand. He put the right hand into a pocket of his jar barn jumper. Then he shouted, giddy up, and he showed Star and Bright the carrot that was in his hand. They came eagerly. Whoa, Amonzo shouted when they reached him, and they stopped for the carrot. He gave each of them a piece, and when they had eaten it, he backed away again, put in his hand in his pocket, and shouted, Giddy up! It was astonishing how quickly they learned that giddy up meant start forward, and whoa meant stop. They were behaving as well as grown-up oxen when father came to the barn and said, that's enough, son. Amonzo did not think it was enough, but of course he could not contradict father. That means to say the opposite of what father said. Cabs will get sullen, howdy, and stop minding if you, them if you work them for too long at first, father said. Besides, it's dinner time. That's what we call lunchtime. Amonzo could hardly believe it. The whole morning was gone in just a minute. He took the bow pins, let the bows down, and lifted the yoke off the cow's necks. He put Star and Bright in their warm stalls. Then Father showed him how to wipe the bow and yoke with wisp of clean hay and hang them on their pegs. He must always clean them and keep them dry or the calves would get sore necks. In the horse barn, he stopped just a minute to look at the colts. He liked Star and Bright, but calves were clumsy and awkward compared to the slender, fine, quick colts. Their nostrils flared when they breathed, that means widened out. They tossed their heads and fluttered their manes and daintily pawed with their slender legs and little hooves, and their eyes were full of spirit. I'd like to help break a coat, Amonzo ventured to say. It's a man's job, son, father said. One little mistake would ruin a colt. Amonzo did not say any more. He went soberly into the house. It was strange to be eating all alone with father and mother. They ate at the table in the kitchen because there was no company today. The kitchen was bright and the glitter of snow outside with the glitter of snow outside. The floor and the tables were scrubbed bone white with lye and sand. The tin saucepans glittered silver and the copper pots gleamed gold on the walls. The tea kettle hummed in the geraniums in the window were redder than Ma's red dress. Amonza was very hungry. He ate in silence, busily filling the big emptiness inside him while father and mother talked. When they finished eating, mother jumped up and began putting the dishes into the dishpan. You fill the wood box, Amonzo, she said, and then the other things you can do. Amonzo opened the woodshed door by the stove. There, right before him, 
was a new hand sled. He could hardly believe it was for him. The calf yoke was his birthday present. He asked, whose sled is it, father? Is it, it isn't for me, is it? Mother laughed and father twinkled his eyes and asked, do you know any other nine-year-olds that want it? It was a beautiful sled. Father had made it of hickory wood. It was long and slim and swift looking. The hickory runners had been soaked and bent into long, clean curves that seemed ready to fly. Amonzo stroked the smooth, shiny wood. It was polished so perfectly he could not even feel the tops of the wooden pegs that held it together. He didn't use nails or screws then. There was a bar between the runners for his feet to rest on. Get along with you, Mother said, laughing. Take that sled outdoors where it belongs. The cold stood steady at 40 below zero, but the sun was shining. And all afternoon, Amonzo played with his sled. Of course, it would not slide in the soft, deep snow, but in the road, the, buck, the bobsled runners had made two sleek, hard tracks. At the top of the hill, Amonzo started the sled and flung himself on it, threw himself on it, and away he went. Only the track was curving and narrow, so sooner or later he spilled into the drifts. He flew off into the snow drifts. End over end with the flying sled and headlong went Amonzo. But he floundered out and climbed the hill again. Several times he went to the house for apples and donuts and cookies. Downstairs was still warm and empty. Upstairs there was sud sud of mother's loom. That's how they would weave the yarn together to make cloth. And the clickety clack of the flying shuttle. Amonzo opened the woodshed door and heard the slithery soft sound of sh the shaving knife and the flap of a turned shingle. He climbed the stairs to father's attic workroom. His snowy mittens hung by their string in, round his neck. In his right hand, he held a donut. In his left hand, two cookies. He took a bite of donut and then a bite of cookie. Father sat astride of the end of the shaving bench by the window. The bench slanted upward toward him. And at the top of the slant, two pegs stood up. At his right side was a pail of rough shingles, which had to be split with his axe from short length, which he had split from his axe from short lengths of oak logs. He picked up a shingle, laid it on its end against the pegs, and then drew, that means pulled, the shaving knife up its side. One smoke stroke smoothed it, another stroke shaved the upper end thinner than the lower end. Father flipped the shingle over, two strokes on that side and it was done. Father laid it in the pile of finished shingles and there was another rough one against the pig. His hands moved smoothly and quickly. They did not stop even when he looked up and twinkled at Amonzo. Be you having a good time, son? He asked. Father, can I do that? Said Amonzo. Father slid back on the bench to make room in front for him and Amonzo straddled it. There he is. And crammed the rest of the donut into his mouth course. He took ha the handles of the long knife in his hands and shaved carefully up the shingle. It wasn't as easy as it looked. So father put his big hands over Amonzo's and together they shaved the shingle smooth. Then Amonzo turned it over and they shaved the other side. That was all he wanted to do. 
he got off the bench and went to see Mother. Her hands were flying, and her right foot was tapping on the trindle of the loom. Back and forth the shuttle flew from her right hand to her left hand, back and back again. Between every, between the even threads of the warp, as swiftly the threads of the warp crisscrossed each other, catching fast the thread that the shuttle left behind. Now this is what his mother looked like when she was working at the loom. I saw somebody working one of those one time. Very interesting. Thud, said the trendle. Clickety-clack, said the shuttle. Thump, said the handbar, and back flew the shuttle. Mother's workroom was large and bright and warm with a heating stove chimney. Mother's little rocking chair was by one window, and beside it a basket of carpet rags, torn for sewing. In the corner stood the idle spinning wheel. That means it wasn't being used. All along one wall were shelves full of hanks of red and brown and blue and yellow yarn, which Mother had dyed last summer. But the cloth on the loom was sheep's gray. Mother was weaving undyed wool from a white sheep and wool from a black sheep twisted together. What's that for? said Amonzo. Dad's point, Amonzo mother said. Oh, don't point, Amonzo mother said. That's not good manners. She spoke loudly above the noise of the loom. Who is it for? asked Amonzo, not pointing this time. Royal, it's his academy suit, said mother. Royal was going to the academy in Malone next winter and mother was weaving cloth for his new suit. So everything was snug and comfortable in the house and Amonzo went downstairs and took two more donuts from the donut jar and then he played outdoors again with his sled. My, he gets to eat a lot of sweets, do you? Too soon the shadows slanted down the eastward slopes and he had to put his sled away and help water the stock. Stocks the animals, of course. For it was chore time. The well was quite a long way from the barns. A little house stood over the pump and the water ran down a trough through the wall and into a big watering trough outside. The troughs were coated with ice and the pump handle was so cold that it burned like fire when you touched it with the bare, your bare hands. Boys sometimes dared other boys to lick the pump handle in cold weather. Amonzo knew better than to take that dare. Your tongue would freeze to the iron and you must either starve to death or pull away and leave part of your tongue there. Amonzo stood in the icy pump house and he pumped with all of his might while father led the horses to the trough outside. First, father led out the teams, with the young colts following their mothers. Then, he led out the older colts, one at a time. They were not yet well broken, and they pranced and jumped and jerked at the halter rope. Because of the cold, father hung on and did not let them get away. All the time, Amonzo kept pumping as fast as he could. He had to pump that up and down. The water gushed from the pump with a chilly sound, and the horses thrust their shivering noses into it and drank it up quickly. Then father took the pump handle. He pumped the big trough full, and he went to the barns and turned out the cattle. Cattle did not have to be led to the water. They came eagerly to the trough and drank while Amonzo pumped. And then they turned back to the warm barns and each went into his own place. Each cow turned into her own stall and put her head between her own stanchions. They never made a mistake. Whether this was because they had more sense than horses or because they had so little sense they did everything by habit, father did not know. 
Now, Monzo took the pitchfork and began to clean the stalls while Father measured oats and peas into the feed boxes. Bro came from school and they finished the chores together as usual. Amonzo's birthday was over. He thought he must go to school the next day, but that night, Father said it was time to cut ice. Amonzo could stay home to help, and so could Royal. Hmm. Wonder what cutting ice is. Do you have any idea? Well, we'll find out. It sounds like Amonzo had a really nice birthday to me. Well, it's Maria from Still Dreaming Homestead. I want to pray blessings on you and yours in your house and out of your house in the day and the night. And whatever you do, keep dreaming. Good night.